Hello, I'm Don Durham, and welcome to Patent Pod. We've been talking with Dr. Amanda Vander Hayden and Dr. Robin Cotting about their recent article, Belief Based versus Evidence Based Math Assessment and Instruction What School Psychologists Need to Know to Improve Student Outcomes. Thank you, Dr. Vander Hayden and Dr. Cotting, for continuing to talk with us about the differences between belief based and evidence based instruction. I'm, I'm glad that we're able to kind of do this multi part series on Patent Pod about this. We want to um, kind of dig in right now to the notion of fluency and automaticity. The field seems to understand fluency in terms of reading, but when discussing fluency in mathematics, many people believe it to be synonymous with automaticity. Can you both kind of bring some clarity on the similarities and differences between these two ideas? I'll start. I love to talk about fluency in math because I think it's it's broader than procedural fluency, and that's not to downplay the importance of procedural fluency because procedural fluency is is shown to um, benefit conceptual understanding. That's very important and often misunderstood by educators. And at the same time, conceptual understanding can can benefit procedural fluency, believe it or not. So it's a bi-directional iterative relationship, but fluency in math is, is broader than that. Fluency is also about the ease with, with which children can explain their answers, can make predictions about what their findings might be, can demonstrate flexibility in approaching problems in different ways. And I think these are ideas that are, are embraced very much by the math ed world but then I think sometimes they misunderstand what we talk about as researchers when we talk about fluency in math, right? And so it does necessitate timed performance. That is the only way really to capture and measure fluent performance, just like in reading, we time a reading sample or we might time a phoneme, um, a phoneme task. We do that because once you get to 100% accurate, which is how teachers typically like to measure proficiency and skills. Once you get to 100% accurate, there's nothing more that the accuracy metric can tell you about uh, gains in understanding. And yet we know that there are really big differences between two children who are both 100% accurate and one can easily solve it, can solve it multiple ways, can explain to a buddy how to solve it, can solve a more challenging iteration. But the other child, also 100% accurate, has to get the manipulatives out and count, find the answer on a number line, and can arrive at it, but it's laborious, it's very challenging for that learner. And the only way you can detect the difference between those two is to time it as a response is correct per minute um, answer. And when you do that, and it doesn't matter, I mean, you could do a two minute timing, you could do a one minute timing, you could do a five minute timing. There's some flexibility around that, um, but, the only way to capture the greater uh, proficiency of the first learner in, in the scenario I just gave is to time the performance. The first student, given the same amount of time, will solve more problems correctly. Mm -hmm. So the fluency metric, when teachers leave it on the table and they fail to include it in their practice, and we can talk about why they do that if, if you want, um, but when they leave that on the table, they lose really important information. And this is what we showed in the article with the scatter plot which we plotted accuracy scores for fourth grade kids against their fluency scores. And what you find is a lot of, an awful lot of children will be 100% accurate, but they are not facile enough with the problem solving that we can know for certain that they will retain that skill over time, that they will be able to use that skill to solve more complex related problems, which is what math is all about. So we, we, want, we want teachers to feel empowered to uh, collect fluency information on their students and to use tactics tactics to promote fluent and facile performance too. So fluency is much more of a broader sentence kind of state if you're, if you're thinking, you're looking at um, you know being able to articulate what, why, and how you did something. The flexibility to understand there may be different ways that I could solve something or figure something out. But then also, you know, the ability to kind of apply this knowledge in other places. So transferability is, is speaks to that fluency piece as well. And it goes farther beyond the accuracy piece is what, I, is what I'm hearing you say. Right, so here's the tricky piece for teachers. It comes down to responses correct per unit of time. So that can be answers correct in math, that can be digits correct in math, 
And that is not to say that all we care about is children be able to solve procedural problems as rapidly and correctly as possible. It's that that little metric tells us about a child's ability to transfer what they have learned to more complex content, to adapt what they have learned in terms of a problem solving tactic to solve different types of problems, to retain. It tells us whether or not they're likely to retain what they have learned over time. So that's why we, we measure it that way. That is not all we do in instruction, right? So same, same as in reading. But it mm -hmm. is a piece. It's you know the, the rope that everybody uses in reading. We have the same rope in math, and fluency is a very important piece. Well, let me ask you this though, and, and Dr. Cotting, maybe you can help me out with this. I feel like time tests kind of have a bad reputation. So why is that then? Why do they have a bad reputation? And then really, when and how can we use that timed piece to kind of leverage for fluency better? How, how, did, it, how did it get a, repu a bad reputation? How do we use that now moving forward? Well, I mean, I think um, there's a lot of confusion on all of the basic principles of effective instructional practice in math. And that has led, this confusion has kind of led to engaging in practices that aren't actually what is recommended. So mm -hmm. it comes to, I think Amanda really put that well when she was talking about this timed metric and the outcome of that timed metric tells us a lot of pieces of information. It isn't just referring to one thing. And I think when teachers see that not understanding that assessment process, they think, oh, you only care about, for example, digits correct per minute. Well, no, that digits correct per minute score, that's going to actually tell me whether or not I need to go back and provide more guided instruction, whether that student actually understands the relationship between numerals and quantities, whether or not that student is able to um, perform a skill accurately, or maybe they understand how to perform a skill accurately, they haven't had enough opportunities to practice. That one item or that one score is going to give a lot of information about what it is that we need to do to figure out whether or not students actually understand conceptually um, what numerals are and what the process is that they're engaging in, or if there's a problem in the procedural arena. It can tell us both pieces of information, and I think that's a big mis misconception. Mm -hmm. Say um, the other part of this is that look, we have a um, education system that has emphasized accuracy always. It's in all of the major documents, the National Research Council 2001, the National Math Advisory Panel 2008. It, it indicates that we have this emphasis on accuracy that's, that's, not a, that's fine, but it's only one aspect of the learning process. And I often talk about um, the stages of learning or skill development. We talk about that, we often refer to the instructional hierarchy. Mm -hmm. And it suggests the first stage of skill development is becoming accurate. That's that's where our U.S. education system has stopped in math. Um, and unfortunately, there's many stages past that that Amanda referred to. The second stage is fluency. Is the student efficient and accurate? Um, we have lots of really good data. It's hardly ever do we have replication studies, right? Um, this is a big replication crisis we talk about in education. We have this um, in this particular area. There um, is data that shows that both accuracy and fluency are independent contributors to word problem and pre-algebraic skill. We have that from Carr and Alavi of 2011 and Fuchs and colleagues in 2016. We have replication that both are necessary. There's lots of data in the uh, fraction literature to demonstrate that unless you are have fluent understanding of whole numbers, you actually can't capture all you need to know about fraction knowledge. There, it's just a repeated data to illustrate the importance of fluency. Um, the other problem that we run into is that there is a surprising number of opportunities to practice or respond, as Amanda was referring to, that are required in order for students to be able to actually build fluency. Um, and then, you know, we haven't actually talked about automaticity, and I just wanted to say that automaticity to me is an outcome. Mm -hmm. Students are accurate, they're fluent, they can maintain that performance over time and under different conditions and answer lots of different questions with that particular skill, then they become automatic. That's the outcome. Um, and we hope, everyone hopes, math educators want students to be automatic in their outcomes. It's just that how are we going to get there?
Yeah. Automatic doesn't mean that a child can't explain, right? That they're like a little robot, that it's just, you know, they see the problem, they answer it, but they have no idea how they got there. That is not the goal. And that's just a misunderstanding. I think about um, Asha Jatendra's great work around, you know, textbooks and what exactly appears in textbooks. And so I always say when I'm working with um, systems to try to improve math outcomes, I say you absolutely cannot rely on your textbook, and it doesn't matter which textbook you have, to um, provide sufficient opportunities for children to build fluency to attain mastery level performance, which is what we're after. So you, you have you go into you have to know as a teacher you're gonna have to supplement. And I love what you said that teachers often underestimate or misunderstand the amount of practice that is required to build fluency. And of course you can do it in a number of ways. You know, I have a slide that I use, it's, it says, you know, class-wide math intervention, not your mama's drill and kill. It's not, I mean, fluency building intervention with kids should feel fun and engaging. There's a high rate of responding. You've adjusted the task to be aligned with what they're ready to practice, meaning they've acquired the understanding. They have conceptual understanding. They are ready to, practice and make it easier for, for the child. So, you know, there's all these analogies we can use in the world around, you know, sports performance or learning to play a musical instrument or learning a foreign language that that comes about by mastering the foundations. And when the foundation skills as a piano player are easily done by you without laborious thinking and effort and struggle, when those come easily, that's what permits you to sit down and create and just play and enjoy what you are doing. I mean, Ken Johnson at Morningside Academy says fluency is what you, the things that you do when no one is watching because they come easily to you, right? So let me, I want to circle back to three key points that the both of you had made. There's so much more behind that one timed metric piece. There's so much more information to be gained besides just a single number. And I think that's something we need to keep in mind when we think about um, timed measures. You had also um, spoke about that hierarchy of learning. And when we think about, yes, we want our students to be accurate in any content. We want them to be accurate, but then go beyond that to be efficient at their knowledge and be able to articulate and flexibility and transfer transfer that knowledge really speaks that fluency piece. And then we had also talked about automaticity really being the outcome. It's the ultimate goal of doing that. And so I think that those are three key pieces um, that I just kind of wanted to bring our attention back to. Now let me ask you this. I, I think there's a connection here between deep procedural knowledge and this um, concept of fluency. So help me understand it and maybe you can kind of add more depth to my understanding and those that are, are viewing this episode today. Um, help me understand the, the deeper connection between deep procedural knowledge and fluency. Yeah, so, you know, D Star 2005, John Starr really wrote a paper that I think every math teacher should read. It's such a great paper. You can find it online. Maybe we can send you the reference to Please. put it up so that people can link and read it if they want. And it's really a pretty short piece, but, but it masterfully explains why um, the world of math education began to sort of pit conceptual understanding against procedural understanding as though these two things are at odds. Um, he really masterfully articulates where that comes from. And we also summarize some of that in our, in our article because I know I'm very influenced by John Starr's work. But, but fundamentally for me, he was the first person that I read where it began to really make sense to me that we did a poor job describing what procedural mm. fluency and procedural knowledge really looks like. And so he, he int introduced this idea that there can be very shallow procedural knowledge and there can be deep procedural knowledge. And deep procedural knowledge for him included things like understanding heuristics and being able to use those to solve uh, math problems. He introduced the, um, the uh, idea that children could demonstrate flexibility. For me, this is where I first encountered this and I thought, now I understand this is like a light bulb going off because I, you know, I had always known in my world and in my work and in my research that when we built um, acquisition and then we cultivated fluency and, and brought children to a mastery criterion on, on basic math skills, that often we would see generalization just sort of happen. Mm -hmm. And we did not really even have to deliver extensive um, instruction 
around um, children being able to adapt that skill in the service of more complex problem solving, it would just sort of naturally happen. Um, this, in fact, this happened so widespread with class-wide math intervention, which is a fluency building intervention by design. Um, it happened so much so that only 2% of a population in uh, a study that, that we did and a project that we did in Arizona ever required tier three math intervention. Hmm. I did not expect that. I mean, I really wanted to study tier three math intervention and uh, it kind of killed my sample because they had such a dramatic uh, result just from, from fluency building. But, but I think that's because fluency building um, can be done poorly and it can be done well. And an example of doing it poorly is just having children um, practice without feedback practice without reference to what kind of practice they are ready for. So when when I hear about, you know, the old school drill and kill, it goes like this. The first nine weeks, we're going to work on addition facts. So the teacher's going to give the same worksheet with the same problems in the same order for too much time. They're going to score it for accuracy, which tells you nothing about fluency. And then they're not going to advance the difficulty of the content or change the content in a systematic way based on student learning that's sort of like just totally divorced from what children are ready for. Mm -hmm. um, to me, the most significant innovation in uh, education research for me personally that I can identify as the instructional hierarchy. And that concept literally to me undergirds every successful innovation that I can point to um, that I enjoy working with with schools and RTI and math improvement, even in reading. So when you when you are deciding what type of instruction to deliver based on what the learner is ready for, you get this very powerful um, effect on learning. I mean, Robin did one of the one of my favorite studies, a meta analysis with Matt Burns and and I forget the other author, Lakito, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and anyway, it's you guys call it the skill by treatment interaction, but it's really a demonstration of the effect of the instructional hierarchy and its connection to learning. And so what Robin and colleagues have demonstrated, calling it the skill by treatment interaction, and I better say Matt Burns, or he'll be mad, I didn't mm -hmm. say his name, but, uh, but was if you give the child the wrong kind of instruction. So if they're ready for fluency building instruction and you continue to give acquisition instruction, their, their learning actually mm. decelerates. And what White and Herring demonstrated many, many years ago in the 70s is that disruptive behavior goes up. So it's a frustrating experience for children to receive instruction that is not aligned with what they're ready for. So I hear you talking a lot about that instructional hierarchy, and it sounds like that's really where we need to really we need to focus our understanding about is where are our students, where is my instruction going to lie, and then that would help them move through this kind of stages of this progression of learning from acquisition to fluency and moving on. Is that am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, and fluency building can be very game-like, and there mm -hmm. there are some sort of evidence-based active ingredients, and those include that, first of all, you've chosen a skill that the child is accurate on. They can accurately and independently complete it, and they can explain to you how they have solved it. If they can do that, um, then they are ready for a fluency building intervention in that particular content. And fluency building can be game-like. It can Certainly, it can be flashcards. Certainly, it can be worksheets, but it can also be games, and you can mix it up. Um, but you need a weekly measure, it has to be timed, and then based on what you learn, so what the proficiency is on the timed assessment, you need to be willing to adjust that content, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then there need to be goals for improvement, there need to be opportunities for children to correct any errors that they made during the independent timed practice period, and that's it. I mean, those are the basic ingredients, I think. Did I miss something, Robin? For nope. <laughs> I think that, that that piece that you had said that, you know, fluency can be done well or done poorly. And it sounds like there's lots of options for us to be engaging in fluency instruction that is solid um, and grounded in evidence and is going to move student outcomes. But we need to be cautious of those practices that are poor in regards to fluency instruction. So I think that's something to be mindful of. And I, I appreciate you walking us through this particular piece of fluency versus automaticity, because I do think it's an area we need to clarify and make sure that we understand um, thoroughly and deeply enough to be able to articulate it um, with our colleagues and to our students. Now, I want to ask you this. I think, and I think Robin's point was the key, which is that 
if you're just following the textbook as a teacher, mm. you will not do adequate fluency building because most textbooks are not equipped to, I mean, maybe I said that, but I'm, I was really responding to what you said, Robin, which is that, you know, most, most core instructional programs in math do not provide sufficient opportunity for fluency building. And so what we're really saying to teachers, you know, if this resonates with you, teacher, if you have taught a concept and then a month later you teach the next iteration and the children don't remember how to do the skill you already taught and if you feel that frustration that is feedback to you teacher that you did not probably build fluency sufficiently to get children to mastery and therefore they have forgotten what they learned so we are really asking teachers we're asking a lot of teachers because we're asking them to actually build a fluency program to complement mm the instructional tool that they already have because most math core curricula do not provide sufficient opportunities for, for fluency building. So it really is something that has to be teacher initiated, teacher sustained, and there are crummy ways to do it. And then there are very, very, very strong ways to do it. In fact, when Matt and I used to give these trainings in Minnesota for years and Wisconsin on uh, math RTI, we would say one third of your lesson should be focused on introducing new content and understanding. So it's high quality acquisition instruction. One third of your lesson should be around fluency building and one third should be application and problem solving. Well, I think you made a good point there. And I appreciate you mentioning that it is hard. It is hard to continue and, and to build a, a complement to the tool that you already have in your classroom. And so I appreciate the both of you kind of acknowledging that for our teachers. I think it's important for them to hear that. And, and I want to ask you, specifically as it relates to fluency and automaticity and our classroom practices, um, what advice might you offer to those who are listening, kind of geared in that direction? And Dr. Cotting, I'll ask you to kind of start off. What might we say to those in the field to help them with the fluency and automaticity piece? and getting our students there? Um, well, I think, you know, it's, we've said it a, cu a couple of times, so we'll say it again. It, it has to be part of the equation. Mm -hmm. Where I am, what the schools and the districts and the educators that I've spoken to, worked with, or talked to, the fluency building is not part of the routine or it gets sent home. Um, and, and that's not appropriate either. It can't, it, ask okay. parents to be fully responsible for building fluency is not a, is not a, the only solution or, yeah. or the appropriate solution. That time, as Amanda said, has to be built into the classroom. There's many ways to do it. Uh, we have to, schools at have to, or teachers have to be willing to leverage their administrators and saying, give us the resources or time that we need. Amanda's pointed out, you actually don't need to have complicated resources. Mm -hmm. um, you can do this very simply in schools. It's just about building in that time for it. Um, I think the other thing that I have run into is starting to talk to schools about what Common Core means and what standards are actually necessary to um, and, and how they use the timing on those standards. Um, that one of the common um, suggestions to me that often comes up is, well, how do I spend the time to build fluency because I, I have to meet this other standard. And there isn't the understanding that if you don't build the foundational skills that are going to lead to the standard, the students aren't going to be able to access that higher level standard anyway. And so that's really, we have to take it back a notch and help educators understand that the acquisition and the fluency, it together will allow students to achieve that standard and then to achieve future standards. And that really becomes an important part of the conversation to get buy-in to then do these really actually simple and fun activities that are going to promote fluency. So just ensuring that it's a part of the equation, that's the biggest piece to take away um, from what I'm hearing both of you talk about is that's, that's the advice here. Just ensure that fluency is a part of what's going on in the classroom. And that may mean pulling in um, and supplementing a little bit or complementing what's going on in the classroom, but ensuring we get our students to that, that stage. I think that those are key pieces to think about. So I'm, I'm glad we're continuing our conversation about the article um, that was published regarding belief-based practices and philosophy-based practices. And I look forward to continuing this conversation with both of you um, kind of moving forward to the next tension. So thank you both for hanging out with Pat and Pod. We so appreciate it. Yep. Thank you to all of you in the field. You inspire educational growth in your students every day. A special thank you to John Ragsdale for producing this podcast. We'll see you next time on Pat and Pod. Thank <laughs> you.